Good evening, dandies. Welcome to Undetermined, the podcast. I'm Matt, by the way. Yes, Matt. I'm Tom. Nice to meet you, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Glad to meet you. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. I've been trying to get a hold of somebody from MUFON. We live in Missouri. Uh, I live in Columbia, Missouri. Matt lives in Kansas City, respectively. So it's like we're a bit of a hotbed for, for a lot of like UFO phenomenon and things here. Oh, yes. A lot of sightings that are and, and And we've always had an interest in the subject, no doubt. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. We talk about it a lot. Uh, and just as a qualifier, too, we're in any man's podcast. You know, you talk about Whitley Stryber, you talk about, you may talk about Commander David Fravor, or or you talk about Travis Walton. We may know who that is. Uh-huh. Anything beyond that, we may not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Then it'll be my job to explain. <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. I'm sure there will be lots of things that I, I don't know about, but I'm always open to hearing new ideas and new things and gathering new facts. There's a lot out there. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, there is. And the big thing, too, just to kind of qualify this, I've always followed stories about, uh, you know, the paranormal and UFOs especially. But in recent light of things that are coming out in the New York Times, things that are coming out with uh, like Commander David Fravor and talking about uh, or the Navy's new policy Mm -hmm. of what's going on with uh, classification of ufo sightings in the government and, and things like that i'm like this is, to me this is really revolutionary uh-huh. things are changing yes out there to a degree and and i just kind of had this thought lately that it's like the i guess the the, the just sort of the debunking spirit is in America so deeply that even though these revolutionary things are happening and these revolutionary things are changing, people are still like, "Uh uh-uh. Yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah, and it's like, but are you, you the government at this point is saying, we don't know what these things are, and in some ways, kind of in a roundabout way, saying, we need help. (laughs) You know? If you have any information, let us know. And it's weird to me that it's taken off so lately, I'd say from probably 2013 around that era till around now. Mm -hmm. But we'll let you speak on that. You're the expert. Okay. But let us introduce you real quick. I can do that. We are talking to Tom Whitmore from uh, MUFON, the uh, Mutual UFO Network. Nice to meet you. Yes, we're very excited. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So maybe before we get uh, too deep on that, though, tell us a little bit about your background in MUFON and then tell us about like uh, how, how you came into this. Yeah. I w- I'm 67 years old. I was born in 1953, so I'm a Cold War baby. I grew up in the Cold War. Okay. And I grew up seeing the day of the Earth stood still and watching the original Twilight Zone in black and white, mm-hmm. uh, watching the invaders and growing up with, with UFOs in the major media. They Back in the 50s and 60s, newspapers and even television actually reported on a lot of things that were going on with UFOs. Right. And when I was about 12 years old, I was at a friend's house and I saw a book on the shelf by Donald Kehoe. And it really captured my interest. And I started reading his books and, you know, and I got interested in in the subject of UFOs at about age 12, 13. Now, I didn't get active until the early 90s. And in the late 80s, um, I saw a UFO magazine on a storefront, and I read that. Uh, it was full of all of the current uh, UFO rumors. Mm-hmm. I turned on the TV one day, and I saw, I, I happened to catch the UFO cover-up live program, which is a, a UFO documentary in the late 80s. So mm-hmm. I really started getting interested. I started buying books. I started reading up on the subject quite a bit. At the same time, I've always read history. I've read a lot of history books, and, and, and I became you know pretty I got a pretty good feel for state power and the kinds of things that states do and their interests. And I got interested in espionage and intelligence works. So when the MJ-12 document controversy came into the fore in the late 80s and early 90s, when I I first saw the MJ-12 documents, I thought, this is some kind of intelligence operation. 
Mm-hmm. So at that time, uh, I decided to join MUFON, and I was living in San Antonio, Texas. I lived in San Antonio for 30 years from 1984 until just last year. And uh, at the time uh, that I got into MUFON, it was being run out of Seguin, Texas, which is just a few miles from San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And it was being run by Walt Andrus. And I became a section uh, director in San Antonio. I got my field investigator's card. I started investigating, investigating cases. Well, in 1995, the UFO groups, the three UFO groups at the time, MUFON and the Fund for UFO Research and CUFOs, had formed what they called the UFO co- uh, Coalition <laughs> at the impetus of Robert Bigelow. And Robert Bigelow at the time was putting money into UFO research. And Walt Andrus asked me to uh, manage an account that was involved with that. And then in 1995, I was invited onto the MUFON board. And I've been on the MUFON board since then. I was there at the time that Walt Andrus was running it. And then uh, John Schusser and James Carrion and uh, Clifford Cliff and Dave McDonald, and Jan Harzan, and now back, back to Dave McDonald now. So I've been through, I've been the whole, through the whole ball of wax. Oh, no, damn it. Yeah. Wow. I understand you're in, you're in D.C. now, is that right? You retired, yeah. moved there, so getting a little uh-huh. bit more hands-on on the research end of it, spending yeah. some time in the libraries. Yeah, I, uh, I moved in into an apartment in Silver Spring. It's on, uh, it's on New Hampshire Avenue. And it's five minutes away from the National Archives. There, there are two main National Archives bu- buildings. There's the old building that, that's down on Pennsylvania Avenue. But the uh, archive records there only go up to World War I. Mm-hmm. And then the more modern archive records are at uh, what, what's known as NARA II, which is a newer building. It was built in the 1990s. So... Uh, as soon as I moved in, I went straight out of the archives, got my uh, research card. It's kind of like a library card, mm-hmm. and went in there. And the, my first act was to pull one of the MJ-12 documents, the, the Cutler-20 memo. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I got a big kick out of that. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And, and I returned to the archives. Uh, I've spent many days there. I've been through hundreds of documents, and I've also spent many, uh, many hours at the Library of Congress Madison Building, which is kind of category to the cat, catty corner to the Capitol Building. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've really had a lot of fun doing that, and I'm getting ready to go back. Unfortunately, everything's closed because of this COVID thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we get too far into that, I just one of my big curious questions is: okay, as you're rising through the ranks, you first get your uh, your field investigator card, right? How did that? work out like did they hand you like a file folder for, full of cases and say like okay you know check these out how would a typical day go for a field investigator uh you know what you were looking at at that time at that time um i had to argue actually with the group a little bit for uh-huh. to get the group to pay for a phone line and an answering machine right uh so that we mm. could advertise a phone number for people to call Mm. And we did. We did get some. Uh, we got some calls that way. Mm. Uh, now the field investigators. Um, it's a lot different with social media, right? And you have you have a state director. Uh, well, some some people call the head office, or they uh, and maybe the head office in California uh-huh. refers them to the state director or the state mm-hmm. section director. They might get cases that way. They might get emails from the state director. So with social media, there's a lot better communication. There's just a lot better general communication. So it's, I think in general, even though I don't work as a field investigator now, right. I'm sure it's much easier to get cases that way now than it was back when, when I started. Right. But is there sort of like a, a certain criteria or a hierarchy where it's like, okay, we've had three or four people in this region talk about this sighting. We go there, we investigate, or, or is it just logging and documenting? Or, you know, how much, uh, you know, kind of boots on the ground is going on there with, with field investigation? Well, it depends on the, the activity in the state. Right. And you mentioned that Missouri is, is a hot spot, mm-hmm. and it truly is. You all might want to, in the future, have Debbie Ziegelmeyer as a guest. She's okay. the state director for uh, Missouri. 
and cool. she's a MUFON board member. But she can really get into the particulars about a lot of the cases going on there in Missouri. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about here. But the MUFON organization has a field investigators mainly, mm -hmm. and I think it's excellent. It's very detailed. It goes through step by step, you know, how to conduct an investigation. And uh, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the witnesses don't really have a lot of information to convey. Right. Sometimes there's a lot more. So it depends on the situation of the case, how much work the investigator has to do. Mm -hmm. But if it's a really good case, if it's, if it's a detailed case, maybe even with physical evidence, then it, it really is a lot of work to do a proper investigation. Oh, yeah, I imagine. Do you have any of those in particular that you did that were like overwhelming or, or, or like, wow, there's really something here that when you were a field investigator? Personally, I didn't. Mm -hmm. the, the leads that I followed up on tended to be explainable phenomena. Mm -hmm. I did get uh, reports from some people uh, many miles from San Antonio, and they kept claiming that they were seeing UFOs at night. Mm -hmm. And I called the, the sheriff and asked him about it, and he said, well, there's, there's a train that goes through there. Uh, some people have thought that they've seen something you know, from the train light, and the train lights at that time, they, they would actually swirl some. Mm. But, but these, these were boys, and they kept saying that they were seeing UFOs. Well, one night, they called me and said, we're seeing this stuff, and it was overcast, and there were spotlights at a location in San Antonio. Mm. You know, and you have these spotlights going against this cloud cover. So I drove all the way out there. This is a, a long way from San Antonio. Uh -huh. I drove to their exact location, and you could, you could see the spotlights in the clouds, and that's what they were seeing. Uh -huh. So that's an example. Mm. But you were able to debunk that and, you know, still use your logic and things like that figure that out yeah yeah but i guess that's sort of the nature of the beast too when, you, when you're talking about aerial phenomenon and you're talking about things like that they've already occurred you know and they occurred say a month ago and what are you going to look at that's not concrete you know it's not there anymore <laughs> you know that's got to be difficult that's right unless there's physical evidence and that's rare it's it's rare that you have any. That was one that was like a question I had hanging in my head, like what constitutes physical evidence? What, what would you be talking about? about? Because I'm real curious about that. I, I'm, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of that mm -hmm. that's floating around there or anything that's not at least explainable. Uh -huh. Well, uh, there have been cases. Now, we're going back to, you know, the 60s and the 70s of mm -hmm. uh, some UFO, uh, alleged UFO landings. And there, there are a couple of instances. I know there was an instance on the farm where it kind of left a ring in the grass, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where it had been. And uh, theoretically, you know, you can take soil samples and you can take samples of the grass. Uh, you can take a Geiger counter out there, mm -hmm. you know, and see if there's any radiation. You can use any instrument that's available, you know, to do analysis. But like I said, it's rare. Mm -hmm even though there are a lot of reports by experiencers and abductees of seeing UFOs and being abducted and so on and so forth, mm. it's, it's very, very rare that a craft actually lands and leaves an imprint. Mm -hmm. But it has happened before. Right. One time I got, uh, I got a, back then when I was doing this, I got a call from Walt Vandras and he said, I've got a report of a possible crop circle. Mm -hmm. So uh, he called me early in the morning, so I went straight out there before work. And it was in an apartment house in the northeast part of San Antonio mm. uh, it, and uh, in the Windcrest area. And I went out there, and somebody had just taken a lawnmower and cut a circle. <laughs> You're right. Okay. So, you know, you, you get that kind of right. thing. Yeah. You're always going to get those attention getters or, you know. Some people who, you know, it's just, I guess it comes to the territory, you know, well, the Pillsbury Doughboy told me to call you and I thought that, you know, and I, I don't think it necessarily discredits anything because the same thing happens to police. The same thing happens to the Coast Guard, everything else. I mean, they get those same, I mean, we're going to be surrounded by people who are full of woo. That's going to happen. But I was just wondering in particular if there was something that you ran into that was just like, huh, oh, well, that was weird <laughs> or something. Right. 
Well, uh, one time, I, at the same time that I was doing this, and this is back in the 90s, mm-hmm. I got a call from Linda Howe, who now is a famous UFO person. Right. And Robert Bigelow was funding her research. She, her specialty was animal mutilations. Mm-hmm. And she called me on the phone. She said, I've got a possible uh, animal mutilation. And again, in the northeast part of San Antonio, mm-hmm. in, in the Windcrest area, up toward Randolph Air Force Base. So I went up there and I talked to the policeman, and it was a deer that had been slit down the middle, you know, from mm-hmm. from the throat, you know, down to uh, the lower level. Mm-hmm. And he had a picture. He had a picture of it, and I made a photocopy of it. And Linda Howe wanted to know if it, if there was high heat involved. She was looking for cases where there had been incisions or cuts right. with high high heat, like a laser. Oh. And I talked with the with the policeman there, and he said, well, it's probably a couple of teenagers. Uh, they split a deer open and then tossed, they tossed, they found it in one of these car wash bays, you know, where you can go in and wash your own car. Mm-hmm. It, it was sitting in there. So I had to explain to Linda that it was not, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was not a UFO animal related or UFO animal mutilation right. related type of the case. It was a, apparently a couple of teenagers you know the kind of teenagers that get their pickup truck and they and they run over the stop sign. You know that it was that kind of a prank, right? Mm. So with so many false leads and things like that. What what keeps you going? What keeps you inspired from from reading the literature and hearing what other witnesses have said and hearing from people that claim that they've undergone abduction reports, but looking at the whole body of literature, I'm absolutely convinced that there's something to it. Mm-hmm. Now, the Air Force found from their experience when they were running Project Blue Book that around 90 to 95 percent of all the reports were explainable. Mm-hmm. So that's just a fact of life, you know, that that we have to live with in the UFO field. Right. Most of the leads that we follow are, are not going to turn into extraterrestrial flying saucers. Mm-hmm. But there there have been some extremely good cases throughout UFO history. And I'm at. I absolutely convinced that there's something to it. Yeah. I mean, well, when you're talking about that other 5%, that's all it takes, right? If there's something that's beyond anything that can be explained, it, it should be enough, I guess, to at least pique our interest. Mm-hmm. You know, it should be enough that we should have something to look into. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, we do the same for cold cases on murders. We do the same thing for you know, any other event that happens at a, at a military base or, or anything else in, in different phenomena. So I don't disagree with that at all. So what's your take on when we were talking earlier about the, the current cases that are going on, what, what the New York Times has reported, what we're finding with, uh, I guess a lot of people are going to have reference to like the white Tic Tac, um, UFO phenomena being recorded by FLIR, be, being recorded by the Navy, things like that. Have you, what are your insights on that, or or have you done any research into that, or is that not part of what you're doing? I try to keep up with what's going on. Yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you what my take on that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there there are two very key people in this affair: uh, Louis Elizondo, mm-hmm. who was involved in the Department of Defense with the so-called ATIP program, the OSAP program, All right? And Christopher Mellon, who is a very qualified person. He's of the Mellon family of the Mellon fortune. Mm-hmm. And he's worked both at fairly high levels in DOD mm-hmm. and I believe on congressional staff. So Christopher Mellon is a very important person in terms of knowing how to work the system, how to get in there and communicate with people and get things done. Right. And from listening to Louis Elizondo now, he's talked publicly, he's gone on Fox News, he's gone on radio programs you know, internet radio programs. Mm-hmm. And he's at, he actually briefed the MUFON board privately. I had the privilege of hearing that. I want to say for the record, though, he didn't tell us anything that he hasn't told the public. Okay. Right. But here here's the deal. Mm-hmm. Apparently, what has been happening is the Navy has been undergoing all kinds of incidents. Right. They've seen UFOs going underwater. Mm-hmm. They've seen UFOs flying in the air, buzzing their airplanes. Right. They've had UFOs in the water coming out, and they've had 
UFOs in the air going into the water. Mm -hmm. And I think it's gotten to the point that Mr. Elizondo was aware of all of this going on, and there's pushback and resistance in the DOD to follow up on it. Mm -hmm. And he got tired of that. So he he joined this group with TTSA. Mm -hmm. And how all that came about, what's going on with that is kind of a, a, another issue. But what I believe has happened is that Luis Elizondo and Chris Mellon have worked both DOD and at the congressional level, uh, specifically the Senate Intelligence Committee. Mm -hmm. And they have succeeded in getting the Navy to formally accept the assignment of accepting UFO reports. Now, we've all heard, mm -hmm. those of us who keep up with the UFO field, we've heard these stories about pilots seeing UFOs, mm -hmm. and if they report it, their their career, it's not career enhancing. Right. Or if they report it, you know, they land and they're debriefed for three days and they have to sign something, mm -hmm. either sign something and say they won't talk about it, or sign something that says they didn't see anything. Right. And this is the kind of thing that Luis Elizondo has been working on. And I believe that they've succeeded in getting the Navy to formally accept the assignment of accepting UFO reports. And secondly, they've brought to the public level this so-called task force, which is going to be overseen by this Mr. Norquist. Mm -hmm. But this, this has gone public, so this, this is new. And at the same time, they succeeded with the Senate Intelligence Committee, and the Senate Intelligence Committee is essentially ordering the Department of Defense to send them a report every six months of their findings on UFO incidents. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, pretty, that's pretty effective work, if you ask me, wow. for, those, for those two gentlemen. Yeah. Now, what these reports turn out to be, we have to just wait and see. Right. We don't know if there's going to be anything interesting publicly. My guess is most all of it will be classified. Now, the senators on the Senate Intelligence Committee, you know, the Gang of Eight mm -hmm. uh, in both houses, you know, they may be briefed. And they may get to see the interesting information. But I, I personally, I'm skeptical that, that we as the public will get to see a lot of interesting information. Right. From that. And, and I mean, I need to just kind of point out just for the enemy. And I, I think this is a big and significant step just in regard that sort of the overall policy in the past for the U.S. military was just, let's just dismiss all of these things as woo. Let's just dismiss all of these things as crazy talk. And it's almost now, just in the underpinning, it's it's almost as though they're saying, we don't really know. And, and, and I think it was in their best interest to conceal the fact that they didn't know. And as I was saying before, in, in the context of an aerial phenomenon and, and not being able to recreate that or being able to, I mean, how these things may come and go so fast that they would never know what they were or how to define them or anything else. And it's kind of interesting that they're saying, let's create a protocol that says at least we're going to take seriously your encounter and at least we're going to take seriously mm -hmm. what you have to say about it instead of just dismissing it or debriefing it or, uh -huh. or trying to discredit somebody's uh, commit uh, character assassination or anything else. So, yeah, I think that's, that's really significant. It's important. That's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on. Well, it's interesting that it's gone through the Navy, but you may note that the Air Force has been totally silent on this whole thing. Mm, that is interesting. And there, there's opposition in the Department of Defense to going public about UFOs. Mm -hmm. And there's there's even a faction in there, and Luis Elizondo has complained about this publicly, that there is a faction of pretty high-level officers in the military that believe that UFOs are demonic in origin uh. and that we should have nothing to do with it. <sighs> and that's that's another battle that he's been fighting over there. Wow. Still fighting those superstitions. That's strange. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about things about, like, national security. <laughs> you know? Right. God, that's odd. Huh. Well, it, it's very odd that these things go on and they don't accept reports. Now, I, I've also learned from carefully listening to interviews that Richard Doty has given, and Richard Doty was a special agent for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations in the 1980s, uh -huh. and he uh, has contacts in the Association of, of Retired Intelligence Professionals. So he has friends there, and, and he gets information from them as well. 
But Richard Doty has pointed out that actually, if there is a UFO incident on or near an Air Force base, mm-hmm. it's, it's investigated. Right. Okay. And it's actually investigated by the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Oh. Now, the AFOSI is normally concerned with ordinary crime on Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. Property disappearing, drugs, you know, theft, that kind of thing. Right. But they also investigate UFOs if they, if something occurs on or near a, a military base. Mm-hmm. I think we can probably assume that the other military branches have their own investigative services that do similar things. Sure. I was just curious if there was anything out of um, McConnell Air Force Base that you've heard about. I, my cousin and I, and this would have been in, in the late mid to late eighties kind of saw something weird coming from that direction. One night he lives in Wichita and I was visiting and I've always kind of wondered, was this something or was this just like a military thing? So what we saw was like a, just, a, we thought it was an airplane at first, but it went, it ascended super fast and at a really like t- unusual angle, kind of a scare, like probably like an 80 degree angle. <laughs> right? And then it, it got up and that it was pretty fast and then shot off parallel to the ground just super fast it was like making a giant seven yeah. but it was it all happened really fast and that angle just did not seem like anything either one of us had ever seen any kind of aircraft perform mm-hmm. and it stuck with both of us and mcconnell is mcconnell the b2 base uh, i'm not sure i don't know them that well but i remember that was the oh. it was wichita so it would have been mcconnell yeah uh-huh well, it looks like they have a lot of tankers or maybe uh, ELINT type aircraft, you know, like uh, similar to Bo- Boeing 707s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it's, it's some kind of logistics arm of the Air Force. But uh, here, here's what I would advise mm-hmm. when you see something like that. Just something to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. The military has drones, and some of these drones are pretty good size. They're almost the size of a of a regular, they're not as big as a regular airplane. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not an expert on their capabilities, but if you have an unmanned drone, you're going to be able to do things that you wouldn't do with a manned aircraft. Right. You could descend at a very sharp angle if, if the aircraft's capable of, do, of doing that and not have to worry about G forces or effect on the pilot or something like mm-hmm. that. Now, I'm not saying it is a drone, but that's something you might want to keep in mind. Would they have had something like that in the 80s? Yes. Okay. And that, that's where you get back to the Benowitz affair at Kurland Air Force Base. Mm. And Richard Doty has pointed this out, that Paul Benowitz, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Benowitz case, but... No, no, explain that, yeah. Well, Paul Benowitz was, a, he was actually a physicist, and he had a, a business where he was, supply, he was actually a, a contractor to the Defense Department, mm-hmm. and he supplied uh, certain equipment, I think for submarines mainly. But he lived right outside of Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, mm-hmm. uh, just almost at the fence. And he would get up every night, and he had binoculars, and he had cameras, and he had video, and he kept filming all the stuff that he was seeing on Kirtland Air Force Base. Okay. And he thought that they were he thought that they were UFOs. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, he was also recording electronic signals uh, that he was getting off the base, and this this kicked off a whole counterintelligence investigation by AFOSI and the National Security Agency and the FBI and God knows who else. But later on, Richard Doty has pointed out, and I have no way of verifying this, but he pointed out that they were running drones out there. And, you know, we we keep hearing that their technology is 20, 30 years ahead of where we think we are. Mm -hmm. And it's possible they were running some pretty effective drones out there in the in the 1980s, and that's what he was seeing. He thought he was seeing UFOs. Right. Well, and I've always had kind of my suspicions about that with like the Phoenix Lights case, just or at least to put that on the back burner. That an idea. I mean, I know it's it's highly corroborated between so many people who saw that, but it's like, oh, you know, could that have been a stealth aircraft? You know, 20, 30 years prior, when you know, and nobody knowing, did they have that capability? I don't know. Mm-hmm. The bigger thing, too, though, there is who's keeping it secret. And uh, I, I did want to talk to you, too, a little bit about it. you let me know and, and, and doing some research on you that you've, you've done a lot of looking into the MJ-12 case. 
Mm-hmm. What's your most recent research up to on that? Right now, I'm writing a paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, the title of the paper is MJ-12, The Counterintelligence Angle. Mm-hmm. And there are several reasons why I'm getting into this kind of approach. Mm-hmm. There is a person by the name of Greg Bishop, and he has his own podcast, Radio Mysterioso is what it's called. Mm. But he was a friend of Bill Moore in the 1980s. So there was a time when he was working a couple of blocks from where Bill Moore had an office in Los Angeles, and he got to know him, and they got to be friends. Well, Bill Moore was a very serious, very competent, even brilliant UFO researcher. Right. And he was recruited basically through AFOSI to inform on the activities of UFO groups and individuals within the UFO field. And apparently he was promised some inside information as, as a reward for his work, which, is, which I believe was essentially volunteer. Mm-hmm. And Greg Bishop has explained in an internet radio interview that in the 1980s, the U.S. intelligence community was running a pretty large counterintelligence program trying to figure out how many Soviet spies were in the U.S. Mm. Maybe some of the younger kids now don't remember this, but in the 1980s, oh, yeah. the Cold War was still going on. <laughs> right. Russia was bad guys then. Yeah. <laughs> and anybody that knows anything about Russia and the Soviet Union knows that they have a track record of very effective espionage. Mm-hmm. And so I think that the, especially under the Reagan administration, mm-hmm. they were particularly concerned about that. So they underwent this counterintelligence program. Well, I think a small part of it may have been this monitoring of the UFO groups and UFO researchers. Oh. Now, why would they do that? One uh, well-known UFO researcher by the name of Bruce McAfee has stated that Ron Pandolfi, who was of the CIA, that Mr. Ron Pandolfi told him, Bruce McAbee, that the CIA was concerned in the 1970s that the Soviets were attempting to recruit UFO researchers Mm. as informants. Okay. Mm. So in the 1980s, when this counterintelligence work was going on, I think one small part of it was uh, one of the things that Bill Moore did to inform on activities in the UFO field, and possibly there are other UFO researchers that are recruited, that were recruited. Bill Moore has stated that uh, he knew of, I think, maybe two or three, four other UFO researchers that had been recruited to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know who those were. Mm -hmm. So, meanwhile, uh, Bill Moore is supposedly getting this information, this inside information, and at the same time, he was developing contacts uh, within the military and the intelligence agencies of people that were interested in UFOs and were trying to learn more, essentially on their own personal account, not not in an official capacity. Right. So Bill Moore was involved in informing UFO researchers and then developing contacts that he thought would help him learn more about what the government knew about the UFO problem. And then he was also apparently receiving what he believed was a certain amount of in, inside information. Uh-huh. So the MJ-12 documents appeared in 1984. They were postmarked Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they were received by Jamie Chandray, who is Bill Moore's research partner at the time. Of course, it went to Bill Moore, and Bill Moore and Stan Friedman and Jamie Chandray really started studying these documents, and they didn't make them public. Immediately, mm-hmm. they they were sitting on them and, and studying them and trying to analyze them. Mm-hmm. Also, during that time, Timothy Good, who is a well-known UFO author, he's written the book Above Top Secret and other books. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He also received a copy of the MJ-12 documents, apparently the same set that Bill Moore received. Mm-hmm. And then Timothy Good, it became known that Timothy Good was going to publish the so-called Eisenhower briefing document in his book, Above Top Secret. And when Bill Moore found out about that, he decided he had to go public too because he'd been sitting on for three years. So the MJ-12 documents came out in 1987 and it created quite a sensation. Sure. If if for for the unsophisticated eye, when you look at it, I mean it's it's like a bombshell. Right. You know, it's like the smoking gun. 
For a lot of our listeners who aren't going to know exactly what we're talking about with this, do you mind giving like some basic information? I'm sure you could explain it much more articulately than I could or John could. Right. The original set of MJ-12 documents that were received anonymously that we that most people know about now were three documents. The, fir- the main one was what is known as the Eisenhower briefing document. Mm. And that paper was allegedly a briefing for President Eisenhower. It was dated December 18, 1952, which was right before Eisenhower took office mm-hmm. in 1953. Mm-hmm. And the Eisenhower briefing document explains that the Roswell craft was recovered, that there was another UFO recovered in the area of El Indio Guerrero, Mexico, and explained that it explained that beings were recovered and that a very special, very secret group of top military and top government and scientists were formed as a committee of 12 people to study the recovered material and, according to UFO lore, to track the development of the UFO field over time, and thirdly, to manage the public perception about UFOs. Right. So this legend developed of MJ-12 as a <laughs> committee of 12 people, and that's in the document they were known as Majestic 12, right. and they had a shorter acronym, MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C. Mm-hmm. That was the principal document. There, there was one other document with it known as the Truman Forrestal Memo, and it was a very short memorandum, allegedly, of President Truman to Secretary Forrestal, who was at the time Secretary of Defense, this is in September 1947, authorizing him to form this group, MJ-12. Now, a third document appeared later. Bill Moore had received several cryptic postcards giving hints that he could find an additional document at the National Archives. And they went to the National Archives, and they found this document between file folders after going through a whole lot of boxes, they found this document, which is now known as the Cutler Twining Memo. Mm-hmm. And that document is a paper in which it's, it's simply an instruction from Robert Cutler to General Twining mm-hmm. to attend this particular MJ-12. And it says MJ-12 Special Studies Project. So those are the three original MJ-12 documents that, that the public is normally aware of. Now, One thing that people may not be aware of is that Bill Moore self-published a book called The MJ-12 Documents, an Analytical Report. And in that book, he covered a number of documents that he had encountered in his career during the 1980s. And they included such things as the Wetzel Letter and the report on uh, UFO landing at Kirtland Air Force Base Mm -hmm. and the so-called Carter Briefing Document and the Aquarius Telex, and then these other MJ-12 documents that I just mentioned. So that was that's really the original group of documents who were involved. Right. And I hate to just raise my hand and call BS without knowing what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of the, or or some of the latter documents anyway, were considered bogus. You're aware of this, I'm sure, from the U.S. government. You know, of course, it's easy to say that they would say that, (laughs) you know. Uh Uh-huh. It's not hard to do, but in your research and what you looked into, how official would you say that a lot of those documents are, or or is there some possibility that maybe there could have been plants or there could have been manipulations going on with paperwork? Well, there are a lot of things wrong with the Eisenhower briefing document. Mm -hmm. And then it's been argued that Truman's signature on the Truman Forrestal memo was a cut and paste job. Right. Right, like a cut and paste, like it had scratches on like another document that he signed or something. That's right. And then the Cutler Twining memo has been criticized extensively. And and here's where I got a little bit involved in this, because like I said, when I got to uh, Silver Spring, Mm -hmm. I was all excited. And I went to the National Archives. And the first thing I did was I pulled the Cutler Twining memo because it's actually still in the National Archives. And the reason why is because it was originally, I don't know how it got there. Hmm. But it was in the National Archives, and now it's their, you know, it's it's their thing. And attached to the Cutler Twining memo hmm. is a memorandum from the archive supervisor explaining that you should be careful about this document. It may not be genuine. Hmm. And 
the the memorandum, and this is on the internet, you can find it. Okay. But the memorandum explains, you know, how they had gone to various departments. They'd gone to the National Security Council. They'd gone here. They'd gone there uh -huh. to try to find some evidence of MJ-12. And, and they couldn't find, they said they couldn't find anything. And the librarian, the archivist at the Eisenhower Library, uh -huh. I believe, looked at it and had a lot of criticisms of it as well. Right. So it's a, it's a question document, too. Now, what I did was I sent out some let. I went through that memorandum and I looked at the names and I sent letters to, to the people that were uh, named in that memorandum. There was it named several people that ah. uh, were in the National Archives or smart. Uh, one lady was at the NSA mm -hmm. or NSC. And I actually was able to have lunch with the archivist that wrote that memorandum. Huh. How did that go? <laughs> well, I went over to Alexandria, Virginia, and we sat down and had lunch. And uh -huh. I wanted to know how that document got into the archives. Right. Now, the archivist was adamant that nobody came in in the back room and inserted it. Mm -hmm. No MIBs. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I even asked her, I said, look, I said, I'm a UFO person. I, maybe I'm being a little conspiratorial here, but right. you didn't have guys in crew cuts with <laughs> earplugs Black you know, come in right. and make everybody leave the room when they stuck that right. document in. Mm -hmm. And she said, Abs you know, absolutely not. Okay. And the archivists themselves have security clearances. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're cleared to uh, approve documents for public inspection right. or decide that a document cannot uh -huh. be publicly inspected. If you go into the National Archives and you pull documents, you pull boxes, and you know, you're going through this stuff, and they'll they'll be uh, kind of a uh, you know how in file you in files you have a out card, mm -hmm. but there'll be there'll be a sheet in there stating this document's not available for public inspection. Mm. So you know they do things like that. Have you ever had the encounter of somebody trying to gently or not so gently dissuade you? Yeah. Any goons? <laughs> no. And, yeah. you know, I, I've made no secret of this. Yeah. I've been, I mean, you can go on my blog or my Facebook page and see all the internet radio shows I've been on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm being as straightforward about this as I can. I, th I think the main finding I found is that in trying to communicate with other researchers that are related to this subject, I get very little cooperation. Yeah. And I get some hostility. Okay. Ah. But I haven't had any men in black show up at my door and tell me that <laughs> right. you know, right. uh, we know where your family is. We know where you live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, that's all very interesting. It's uh it's cool to clarify that and, and clear that up too. But do you have any and, and I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to talk about it, but theories about you know, let's say, why would they be coming? Why would they come here? Is there anything that drives you on that? Or are you just genuinely a person who's just like, uh, just the facts, ma'am? Or do you have anything like theories as to why, say, any extraterrestrial being or anybody from another planet would want to kind of, you know, interlope in what we have going on here on Earth? Well, my personal opinion is that there are at least several groups coming here. Mm -hmm. Where they're coming from, I don't know. I don't know if they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional or ultra-terrestrial, mm -hmm. but there, there are several groups. Now, experiencers and abductees report for the little gray guys. Right. They report taller gray guys. They report grays with a large nose, so-called large nose grays. Mm -hmm. They've reported insectoid types, these praying mantis mm -hmm. kind of beings. Uh, they've reported reptilian-looking beings, and then even human-looking beings, these so-called Nordics. Right. You know, with blonde hair and blue eyes, and, and that look very similar to humans, but they're a little bit different. Right. So the reports, the preponderance of the reports indicates that one or more of these groups is interested in our genetics. Now, why? I don't know. I mean, that's a matter of speculation. Right. But the abductees, as you know, have reported, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sperm and ova being taken and right. anal probing. Yeah. Pregnancies being interrupted and hybrids and all this, all this, all these stories. Mm -hmm. Now, why are they doing that? I have no idea. They may have other reasons to be here. 
maybe there are some resources here that they want. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is some kind of consciousness related, telepathic related activity that's going on that we don't understand. I mean, who knows? It's pure speculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And that's, that's sort of a problem. And I just, I thought maybe you'd have a little bit of insight just in that and just your research. And I have a degree in history. I have almost a minor in sociology, things like that. But I, I think of sociological things too. I think of biological things, sure. you know, like the front fixed eyes on graves. Is that biological? Is that predatorial? Mm -hmm. Like a buffalo here on earth has its eyes on the side to watch out for predators. We know we have our eyes fixed front because we are predators, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh-huh makes you wonder about those things who knows you get into theories yeah you know they're creating hybrids that are they've they've gotten them to the point to where they're so much like humans you can't hardly tell them apart right and yet they have abilities that we don't have you know that kind of thing you hear those kind of stories yeah there are some sentiment that one or more of the groups are very concerned that we're destroying the earth and we have yeah. right they're trying to work with us on that. But again, who knows? Sure. Well, I appreciate your objectivity on that. Thank you. I really do. That it's, you know, you're just looking into what's objective. A funny story, though, an aside, I can remember a friend back in the uh, late 90s told me that the Bratz dolls that they were making for, for little girls with the big eyes uh -huh. told me it was like, they're preparing people for alien hybrids, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're just, they're getting them ready to be able to see them and not freak out. Uh -huh. they're, they're pushing these on kids, man, so they can, like, see them. <laughs> yeah. Then they're not going to be scared when they really land. You know, I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. Or maybe just good marketing mm -hmm. makes kids, you know, want to buy them for 10 bucks. One of the things that was going on in the 90s, mm -hmm. we were getting a lot of reports from ab abductees back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were saying that they had received instructions to carry out a particular task in the future. Yeah. And I heard enough of these stories. I, I started getting worried. Do we have a bunch of Manchurian candidates running around? Right. But I don't know of any particular really huge event that, you know, I don't know what task they would perform. Maybe there are tasks that aren't really that, that explosive or that interesting. Maybe they're small tasks. I don't know. Maybe they... Have they performed them? Have they not performed them? I right. don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, that, but I found that to be a, a very intriguing uh, thing. Another uh, story that was going around the 90s was that uh, the government, will, government was going to stage a false UFO event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Okay. And the, uh, Project Blue Beam or Operation Blue Beam. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this, people were saying that 20 years ago, and it still hasn't happened. Right. Uh, it seems to me if they were going to do it, they would have done it by now. Hmm. Well, and there's, there's always that sort of element of debate with, what do they call it in Latin? Uh, absentia absurdum, where it's like you can't prove something that didn't happen in its absence. Uh -huh. You know, you can't say just because something didn't happen doesn't mean that it should have, or, you know, you know, it's a, a lot of Latin terms for debate, but it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Are there any big theories out there that you call just BS on that from your personal perspective? You're just like, oh, come on. Well, that's a good question. Well, one of the things that happened in the, in the eighties was, uh, during the Benowitz affair, there was a lot of angst in the conservative UFO community that Richard Doty and the Air Force Office of Special Investigation mm -hmm. was leading Paul Benowitz on to believe all of his really wild theories about underground bases. And mm -hmm. There's there's an alien invasion and they're taking over. Well, two people got involved on the rumor side. Uh, John Lear, he's a famous person, son of a Learjet company, and and this other person by the name of William Bill Cooper. And they really went to town with these rumors. Mm -hmm. And uh, these rumors really spread in, into the late 80s and early 90s about underground bases, and all these secret projects, and the uh, relationship with the aliens. And they had a treaty with the aliens. Yeah. And uh, they were abducting people and all of this. So that, that was a whole spate of rumors that took root into the UFO public. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of those a lot of those sentiments are still here today. Yeah. Um I personally am skeptical of the new age angle on 
on the UFO yeah. problem. The, now, this is just my personal opinion, okay? Oh, sure. But that the aliens are here to help us. There are space brothers. They're here to help us develop spiritually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we, if we just meditate right and fly right, you know, we'll be in communication with the good aliens who are trying to help humanity. And mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Maybe it's true, but I'm, I'm skeptical of that. Right. No. What was the sneakers, tracksuit, cultish, um, heavens? Oh, heaven, heaven's gate. Yeah. yeah. Heaven's gate. Oh, God. Yeah. It also reminds me of that scene in Mars Attacks where, you know, the girl is sitting on top of the van with the crystals on her head and like <laughs> you know, praying. And then really, right. All they wanted to do was just blast everybody to death. I mean, it's just, it's comical. Yeah. I, I don't think we're going to communicate with them with amethysts. The Heaven's Gate cult was run by this person. His last name is Applegate. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a picture of the guy, you can, you can tell that he's that he's nuts. But yeah, he was actually there was a section of a book written by Jacques Vallée called Messengers of Deception. Mm -hmm. And the Applegate UFO cult was mentioned in that book, and they had a picture of him. yeah. So it wasn't a shock, but it was very startling to me when that heaven's gate turned up and i knew that this applicate character was involved in that right and and in some ways it wasn't surprising yeah it's sad it's just sad overall yeah and but then you're talking about more things than ufos you're talking about manipulation and you're talking about cultism and that's just kind of gross in general when people do that um you know which is one thing i appreciate about everything you said about your opinions and your research is just that you've you looked into it objectively. You know, you're looking into it as to what you can learn from it rather than what you can profess from it, I think is important. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think all we can hope to do is to learn more. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there, there are no answers. <laughs> right. And that brings me around to a question Matt messaged me. He's like, are you going to tell them your story? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you my story. I do have one encounter that I can't explain. Now, there's a lot of literature, there's a, there's a lot of accounts going around about reddish-orange orbs, right? Uh -huh. This happened to me, me, my wife, and my father in Missouri, in Peace Valley, middle of nowhere. Probably a 60-mile as the crow flies straight line to, oh, what would that have been? That would have been Fort Leonard Wood. Yeah. Right? Would it even be that close to Fort Leonard Wood? As a crow flies, maybe. As a crow flies, maybe. It's a, it's about 100 miles to Fort, but there's all sorts of hills to go through there. So I figure 60 to 80 miles as the crow flies to Fort Wood. This was two weeks after 9-11. We're sitting there in the house. I mean, I, I'm literally sitting on the couch doing nothing. One lamp on the house. I was reading. Put my book down. Looked outside my window. I saw this bright white light, and it looked almost like a helicopter spotlight, mm -hmm. but... Too big, just too big for that and further away, if that makes sense. I said, lit up the whole house. And my wife came in and said, what the hell is that? And I said, there's a light. She looked out the window and said, what is going on out there? I said, I don't know. And we were really concerned because 9-11 had just happened like two weeks before. And I was like, maybe it's something new with military, like flight or, or something. Maybe they're training or, or doing something. But still, the fort's pretty far from us. So I go outside, I look at this light, and there's no, like, no rotor walk, no helicopter, no sound whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Just this giant kind of super basketball-sized white light shining at me. All of a sudden, <sighs> just makes you sound like a weirdo, <laughs> but all these red lights start dropping out of it. I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe flares, you know, <laughs> but then they drop along the tree line maybe five miles away from where I am. And then they just start zipping back and forth mm -hmm. across the tree line. And I can see like the tops of trees being scanned with red, you know, as the red light is shining on them. And I think, okay, if they're flares, I don't know how they're going back and forth. I don't know how they're going. And then they start going up and down mm -hmm. and then they start going down at angles, up at angles, down at angles, up at angles, but at a speed that is so it's beyond faster than anything I've ever seen travel in the physical world. <laughs> Just, I've never seen anything physically in front of me. Maybe something on a computer screen could go that fast. I've never seen anything travel in the real world like this. Call my wife outside. I say, Kelly, get out here right now. Look at this, see what's going on. 
She runs inside terrified, closes the door and says, come in the house. <laughs> My father uh, lives just a little down the way, a little down the road from me, but I can see him from where we live. And, I, and he's on his porch. And I said, dad, get down here. He runs down here. Once he gets past his house, though, he's already looking that way. And he sees these red lights, uh, reddish orange lights, and they're zipping everywhere, up, down, left, right, and it just in a almost a pong like pattern, like a, you know, like the old video game. Mm -hmm. And it's just the one thing I'll never be able to explain. My brother told me times like, "Oh, you saw flares." I was like, "Mike, I've never seen flares go up and down. I've never seen that big." Oh, oh. But it is also one of those things when we talk about an aerial phenomena. If you came out the next day. You'd find nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. All you would have is my story. Right. It'd be a waste of your time to drive down and talk to me. Uh huh. Because it just it was in the air. Uh huh. But it definitely changed my mind. And that was two thousand one. Two thousand one. Yeah. I mean, I've always been kind of interested in, in aliens and mm -hmm. you know UFOs and things like that. But I've never seen anything like that before. Never since. But it was a night that changed my life. So I, I thought, yeah, Matt made me share that story. Yeah, because I've always been curious about what that could have been. I, I would really like it if you would file a report with MUFON on that. I can get you in touch with Debbie Ziegelmeyer, who's the state director. I'd love to. I mean, I tell friends and family about it. And, and I mean, I'm not a crazy person. <laughs> I have a master's degree. I, you know? Yeah. One thing that we have about it is my, my father since passed away, my, my wife's still here. We both have master's degrees. We both teach and we, we can both tell you the same story. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I've always thought about it, as I explain to people, is like, I'm not the only one who saw this. Uh -huh. And I've got a corroboration with another witness as my wife and scared her to death. But uh, And did, did you say that your dad saw it too? He did, but he's since passed. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But he, he saw it too. And uh, he, when he came down, he was walking halfway between our houses. He saw it. I looked up. I saw him. He looked up. He smiled. He shook his head almost in laughter at how absurd it was and walked back into his house. <laughs> huh. And then I waited. I, I watched for it to kind of dissipate and then the, the red lights to kind of disappear beyond and, and go back north. And it was gone. It was over. And I went back and I ran into my dad's house. I said, did you see that? And he said, yeah. I said, what did you think? He wouldn't say a word. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he's an older guy and uh, a Vietnam era veteran. He just, he just laughed, smiled and says, he said, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, are you serious? That was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. He's like, I just don't want to uh, talk about it. Because he was that kind of put off, you know? No. What good it's going to do you, I have no idea. Right. Because it's never going to be created. What was it? Geez, 19 years ago. Right. And like I say, Ariel, it's, I'm never going to encounter again. That, that, that happens a lot. People experience something and they keep it to themselves. Yeah. Sometimes they don't know who to report it to, or they think people think they're crazy, right? Or they're not even sure that they should report it. And this goes on for some period of time. Then 10, 20 years later, they decide, you know, I want to report this. Right. Well, I've checked out the MUFON website and I see a lot of that. I see a lot of like, okay, Missouri represented cases or reports, red lights sipping across sky, <laughs> orange lights sipping across sky, one white light appears. So I'm also thinking, and maybe I'm guilty of this and, and I should probably have reported it, but I'm thinking a lot of people probably look at that and say, well, what difference is it going to make to make one more line in that report? Right. And now I feel kind of guilty about it. It's like, well, one line, line might make a difference, you know? Right. Now I'm kind of wondering, like, oh, I, I have another story. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, what the abduction stories are normally like, because I have a weird story and it could totally be drugs, right? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Were you on drugs? No, I wasn't, but my roommate <laughs> in college. Oh, your roommate. Yeah, it, this was right. like a really weird experience. And I'll, I'll try to do the short version Okay. Matt doesn't do drugs. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm pretty clean guy. Okay, I'm listening. So, so this is like my freshman year of college. So this would have been summer, fall of 89. And my, my roommate, pretty straight guy, just really jovial guy, <laughs> a bit of a prankster. So it's possible that he was pulling a prank on us. But I, I remember one night he was supposed to be going to, he was in the school band. And he was trying to rush for the music fraternity mm. that they had. And he was supposed to go to a meeting and walk across campus to get there. And while he's gone, I get a phone call and they're like, where's Chris? And I'm like, what do you mean? Where's Chris? He, he went to the meeting. I'm like, well, he never came. 
I, I don't know. And then he got a call from like this girl asking where he was that they were supposed to be on a date. And that's not his girlfriend. And he was like steadfastly just super in love with his girlfriend. And then he shows up and he just has like this look on his face like he's freaked out. I'm like, what's going on, dude? And he says, I have no idea where I've been for the last hour. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, I, I was walking across campus. I was going to the meeting and everything just kind of goes black. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I'm standing in the same place, turned in the opposite direction. And it's an hour later. <laughs> I think you're too far from, removed from that, honestly. I don't know. But he got really weird that night. His behavior was like really weird. Mm. Um, and a lot of things happened that I, I don't know how to explain. Either he was pranking us or he had something happen. I don't know. I had a friend, actually, conveniently, who had been learning how to hypnotize people. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're like, well, let's see what happened. Oh, yeah. What's it going to hurt to try and put him under? <laughs> And see, so I called my friend and he lived upstairs from us in the dorms. I'm like, come down, man. We got to see what happened. Uh -huh. We get him to agree to, to do this and we take him to like the flash of light. And, and we're asking, well, what, what, what do you see? What's going on? And he's like, it's all dark, but it feels like I'm climbing up a hill really, really fast, like just rising in altitude. Mm. Um, and he's like, I can feel hands touching me. Mm. Then he just starts moaning. And like it, the moans just got like deeper and more intense. And I'm just like, well, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> it, it starts to sound pretty scary. And I'm like, just wake him up, wake him up. So <laughs> My God. we wake him up and you don't know if it's like moan of pleasure, moan of pain. And yeah. he wakes up and he looks around, gets a big grin on his face and says, I feel good. So apparently moan of pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Man. in my opinion i think you're too far removed from that that guy could have had there's still more to the story he could have been on medication could have been or <laughs> anything one of his pledge brothers came by to ask him like because they were supposed to be studying for the frat what are your purposes mm. that was one of the things they're supposed to learn what are your purposes and he's like, my purposes are to explore and discover new things about mankind. <laughs> so we go back to the, we go back to the nineties Manchurian candidate. <laughs> right. And he would like have these intense headaches yeah. where he would like act normal and then he would act weird. There were all kinds of weird little things that happened the whole night. <clears throat> like the whole, that, that girl call, I, I asked him about the girl when he was acting normal. Right. And he was like, I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. And then. When I ask about it, when he's acting weird, he's like, that's my girlfriend, man. What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know. It was really, really weird. But if he punked us. He could have. It's too good of a punk to, like, not reveal it. <laughs> right. And I don't know. With him, was it just one instance, or did he have any periodic, you know, incidents of acting strange? Well, I mean, I was only roommates with him for a semester, so it's really hard for me to tell you if, like, that that was, like, something that, that was normal for to know of, yeah. But I know he wasn't the type that would do drugs. Now, maybe someone shoots him with, like, you know, acid or something just to mess with him. Who knows? I dosed him, yeah. But it doesn't explain, like, the girl calling. Yeah. And he was really fascinated. Like, when he was acting weird, he was really fascinated with his hands. It won't like he had an extra digit or something. <laughs> like, it's just like, wow, this is cool. He got to go. He was very protective. <laughs> like, he was always, like, looking out for us. Yeah. I <laughs> Like, I went to use the bathroom, and he's like, you going to be okay? I'm like, I'll be fine just going down the hall, man. Well, it's, that's a disquieting set of behaviors, for sure. Yeah. Sure. But behavior is a weird thing, and human behavior is a weird thing. But all I can tell you about what I experienced in my story, dead sober. Another funny thing is, and I can tell you kind of a secondhand story, our old buddy passed away, came out to visit me at the house the next day <laughs> after that happened. And he's facing me on the couch, talking to me, telling me the story, talking about a girl that he likes at work. And that turned out to be his wife eventually. But he looked up, looked behind me, and I have a window behind my head. He went pale white and then looked up and just stopped talking. I said, what's going on? He said, I just saw something. And, and and now I'll admit he had two beers while he was there, and I I said what did you see? He said I I saw something I can't explain. And I said was it lights? And he said yeah. And he said red lights over the trees, way over the trees back there. I don't like what I saw. He's like, can I stay here for a while? I said yeah, yeah, Mike. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that was like one night later. But again, after that, nothing else happened ever again. Just hard to hard to say. That's interesting. People have these experiences and they go from being unbelievers to believers. Yeah. Well, and like I say, I've always had a problem with the ergo. I've always had the problem with saying, okay, I saw this, I experienced this. Ergo, that means there are extraterrestrials from other planets who are, you know, I didn't see a being, Uh you know, I didn't see a creature. I didn't see anything communicate with me. That's good. But what I saw defied physics, defied anything that I, any maneuverability. All I can tell you is just what I saw. You saw something. I saw something that definitely defied anything I've ever seen in my life and have never seen it since. Uh Uh-huh. It should go into the record. Oh, well, that'd be cool. Yeah. Or it's a mystery. Well, we don't want to keep you on too late, man, but this has been a a fascinating conversation, man. I I had a really good time, Matt. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, it was great. Yes, I've had fun too. Cool. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate you. You're most welcome. Everybody, you've been listening to Undetermined Podcast with Tom Whitmore from MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. Great guest. Great episode. We had fun. Yeah. Everybody have a good weekend. Good time. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Bye.